Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, evolutionary insights into modern health. Welcome to Ancestral Health Today. I'm Todd Becker. We're talking today with Dr. Emily Deans. Dr. Deans is a board certified psychiatrist and psychiatry instructor at the Harvard Medical School. She writes a blog on evolutionary psychiatry based on the observation that our brains are healthiest when we embrace a diet and lifestyle that reflect the conditions under which we humans evolved. She embraces a broadly paleo diet, including meat, fish, nuts, vegetables, but avoiding grains and foods with unnaturally high fructose or omega-6 fatty acids. And she also advocates getting plenty of sleep and play in your life. Dr. Deans has presented at the Ancestral Health Symposium in 2012 and 2018 on topics related to this theme. So today, we'll dive into this emerging field of evolutionary psychiatry and what some of the recent clinical studies are telling us about the connection between food and mood, and what we know about the mental health of populations eating a more traditional or ancestral diet compared with those eating a typical westernized diet. Welcome to the podcast, Emily. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. So maybe to get us started, um, how would you define evolutionary psychiatry? And there's some related terms like nutritional psychiatry or food and mood. Um, yeah, how would, so you, how would you do that? Evolutionary psychiatry is really kind of two major um, academic kind of pursuits. One of them is more academic, but it's it's not very practical which is how do genes determine mental health and are there any evolved mechanism by which that happens and um, are there genes perhaps that maybe in certain combinations make you more vulnerable to schizophrenia but perhaps in different combinations some of those same genes might make a population have more creative people for example and was there an evolutionary advantage to that and there's some interesting studies along that and i write somewhat about that but most of what i consider evolutionary psychiatry is more the ancestral health paradigm, which is kind of assuming, okay, we've had, what, 9,500 generations of humans, and all but the last, you know, maybe, what, 500 were, um, you know, were mostly uh, uh, um, hunter-gatherer, and then after that was agricultural, and really only the last four or five are industrial, and then we're sort of at, you know, generation zero for the digital generation. So how does how is the difference of how we evolved and how our brains re um, evolved reflected in our mental health? And maybe can we adjust things without throwing a baby out with the bathwater? Because we've made tons of progress with our health with very modern things like water treatment plants and um, antibiotics and vaccines that are um, helpful and save millions of lives. But um, is there some aspects to how we live now in this digital age that affects our mental health of our hunter-gatherer, mostly hunter-gatherer brains? That's great. And then the, the term nutritional psychiatry huh. uh, overlaps to some extent with this field? or It does, though they... Um, and I bet I guess I consider myself the most... What I often practice um, is more like nutritional psychiatry, though hard to split it out because I also talk to everybody about sleep and activity and everything. Um, but nutritional psychiatry is the field um, that uh, explores and, and does academic research in how does nutrition and what we eat affect our mental health. So, um, but that, that academic um, strain of psychiatry really comes out of um, nutritional research in general, and it's more focused on, for, you know, a lot of the diets that they've uh, said were best for our cardiovascular health. So it's a little slightly different than thinking about a paleo diet, but uh, there's there's almost no evidence for paleo diets, you know, because people just don't study them. Um, but uh, there's lots of evidence, for example, for Mediterranean diets, nutritional psychiatry. Well, so you're trained as a psychiatrist and you teach psychiatry. So what got you interested in this connection between diet and mental health? Because the field of psychiatry seems to be largely focused on pharmaceuticals or talk therapies, and diet is a, a relatively striking you know, entry into this field. How did you get interested in this? Uh, so when I trained, 
um, I guess I finished up my residency in 2004, which is the final. You go to medical school and you go to college, then you go to medical school, and then you go to residency in the U.S. Um, and psych residency is four years. And I, what really interested me, you know, medications are very useful, um, particularly in certain circumstances. Uh, right when I finished training is a lot of data came out about how a lot of the medication, especially with antidepressants and SSRIs, that a lot of the data had been kind of hidden um, when they didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so we had more, you know, the science was saying, oh, it works better than it does. Um, I think we knew in practice <laughs> that it didn't necessarily work as well as we would hope. Um, and I'm not to say that they don't work very well for some people and they don't seem to work at all for other people. Um, but I was really interested in alternatives. If the medicines weren't going to be perfect and they weren't going to be this all this cure all, what alternatives do we have to helping people's mental health? And then, especially where, where also the mental health system is totally overwhelmed, and uh, are there some preventative things that we can do for a population level or recommend them on a population level that could prevent people from ever having to see somebody like me? Um, and so I, and to be honest, therapy is just I'm not that interested in it. It takes a long time and a lot of patience. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do have some therapy patients, but a uh, few because as I can, how many that I can sort of sit still for that, you know, for that long time and do really, really active listening, which is super important. I, I just don't have the energy to do that, you know, 40 hours a week. So um, I was really interested in alternative uh, medicine, you know, supplements and diet and exercise and how that affected mental health. And I started to read kind of like layman's books on the subject. And I was interested in paleo at the time because I had actually lost weight after my um, having my second daughter with paleo. Yeah. Um, and and I've also noticed that my skin looked really great and my, my nails were really good. Like my body really responded quite well to a paleo diet. And I thought, well, you know, if, you're, if it's showing up in your skin and it's showing up in your hair and things like that, it's probably showing up in your brain too. And so I started to look at popular um, books at the time. And I found, unfortunately, when I looked up the references in some of the popular books, the books were really not, they were really overblowing the findings. Now, this was back in 2008, 2009. So I decided the only way I can really look at this is to actually look at the references myself and, and write about it. That's the best way to, for me to learn is to kind of write about things and maybe sort of teach other people. And that's how I started my blog, which very quickly was pulled on to psychology today. Um, and I was very lucky because right about that time is when Felice Jacka um, really started doing some of the first really high quality studies of diet and mood about it. She started off with large observational studies. There are others, but she was really doing, because a lot of the studies before that were frankly poor quality um, in food and mood anyway. So uh, it all happened at about the same time. And so that was fortunate. Hmm. Great. So there's a this part of it came from personal experience, uh, and then an interest in really finding solid evidence based approaches to right. Uh, yeah, not backing this up rather than what's out there, sort of in the popular press. So let's dive into that a bit. What's some of the best evidence you've seen that really connects diet to conditions like depression, anxiety, and other mood disorders? So there are many different types of scientific studies. Observational studies basically follow a group of people over time and just sort of see what happens. And all the large observational studies, um, a lot of them are piggybacked. Um, and they're, they're best if you follow them as you go along. So you don't pick a group of people and say, oh, how, what have you been eating the last 10 years and how do you feel now? Because that's not very good data because people aren't very accurate about what they've been eating for the last 10 years. Um, but most of these studies were tracking. They're very large studies for cardiovascular health. And what they did was they didn't have psychiatrists doing interviews of patients and diagnosing them with depression, which is the gold standard. They just had people fill out questionnaires about their mood um, along, the, along with tracking you know, cardiovascular things. And in, um, se several of these studies showed that people who ate more uh, tradition who were in the quartile or quintile of food that was most like a Mediterranean diet, which is lots of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, um, fish, 
you know, omega threes, those kinds of things. And uh, in other cultures, uh, see, similar studies were done, and the people who adhered more to the traditional diet. So in Japan, a traditional Japanese diet. Um, in Australia, more of a traditional sort of uh, ranch style diet, where you're, you know, eating um, meats that you've uh, garden foods and meats that you've killed and things like that. Well, obviously, they didn't have to kill the meat to be in the study in Australia, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and they found that those people had lower. Uh, in the population had a lower incidence of depression compared to people who ate mostly processed food, for example. Um, and that was repeated again over and over, sort of all over the world in different cultures. Um, and then the second level of evidence or a higher level of evidence is actually doing a randomized controlled trial. There are a couple ways that they did this. There was one sort of a surprise trial in the United States. I think it's called the... Um, Smiles to it. Uh, and this was actually trying to do an intervention for for depression in old in older adults who are at high risk. They had like a minor level of depression. They weren't particularly depressed, but they were at high risk for developing depression over time. And so they did a study where they tried to give uh, sort of like a low key supportive therapy. And then as the control arm, thinking that um, this wouldn't have a mental health benefit, they gave people nutrition classes and cooking classes. And they found that actually both groups um, had lower risk yeah. of depression than doing nothing. Um, so it kind of ruined their original experiment because just intervening with having people cook more fresh foods and eat better, more fresh and, and home cooked foods improved their depression uh, or risk or lower their risk of developing depression. Um, uh, so they got two papers out of it instead of one. Um, but the, uh, other big study was actually Felice Jacker ran out of her Food and Mood Center in Melbourne, and she did a randomized controlled trial. This one is actually the SMILES trial. Um, and uh, she actually treated people with major depressive disorder. Um, so they were diagnosed by psychiatrists, um, and the control group was a um, just like a group meeting together. It wasn't really therapeutic. And... Um, what she did was do, do a Mediterranean diet. The only difference okay. between the depression diets that they use and the Mediterranean diets that they use for um, uh, like cardiovascular research is uh, they do add in a bit of red meat, not a ton, but you know, a couple times a week. It's that's uh, whereas usually in the cardiovascular, they knock out red meat altogether. And the reason she did that is because in all the observational studies with no red meat, there was no effect on depression. So um, it's it was thought that just, a, you know, a bit of, of red meat might be helpful. And there's some things in red meat like iron and creatine and um, things that uh, there's a, a mechanistic reason why they might be helpful for depression. So in the studies with the Mediterranean diet, they weren't adding red meat. So her study was different in that one variable, right? Right. And when I was talking about the observational studies of the Mediterranean diet, um, those people ate all sorts of things, and it's the one who in adhered the most to the study diet that they were recommending. They tend to have less depression, but they're still probably going to be eating red a little bit of red meat now and again. Um, in the dietary trials where they actually give people strict diets for um, cardiovascular disease, often they will omit, like do a low cholesterol diet, for example. And so for that, they will omit red meat. And in those studies, there was no effect on depression. It didn't make people worse, but it also didn't improve people who had a depressed mood, whereas the the diets that had a little bit of red meat actually did um, mm. improve depression as long as it was a more traditional, well, more fresh foods and less processed food diet. So you mentioned some of these earlier studies uh, were really looking at other endpoints like cardiovascular health and the, the, uh, the mood impact was a secondary uh, output right. It yes. wasn't that wasn't the the intent of the study. Whereas the study you cited by Felice Jacka was intended to look at uh, mood effects. So right. that's and it, that's much more of a interventional or a sort of a cause and effect type of a study. Then right. Yes, and they there was another study in Finland that was similar. Um, they had mixed results, um, but they were yeah, there were some issues with that study. 
but it's very it was very it's very difficult to do she did maybe 200 people 185 people um half controls half a diet and um it was uh it, she said the biggest problem with that study was the recruitment because oh. uh, it's a it's a big ordeal to sort of oh i'm going to change my entire diet and you know and uh, one of the interesting things she found, because what people do worry about when they do more fresh cooking and home cooking is that it's going to cost more. Um, but actually, she found that people, now these are Australian di- uh, dollars, but the people saved, you know, 10 to $25 a week, actually, on the uh, study diet. So what, what were the conclusions of the study in terms of any impact on mood conditions? So there were a couple of things that she'd found in this and other studies, which is that people with major depression had decreased depressed mood and the effect size was a similar to an antidepressant. Really? Um, so it was very similar to a pharmacologic intervention. And uh, she did another study where she followed the um, size of a certain part of the brain that's important for sort of like thinking and memory over time and the people that was interesting too because the people who adhered more to uh, fresh foods diets you know everybody's brain shrinks over time and this was over a couple decades um but the people who adhered to uh less of a processed foods diet their brain shrunk less this was the whole brain or the hippocampus it was the um the hippocampus hippocampus yeah which is really key to you know memory and, yeah. and things like that right and yeah. processing yeah so that's so. These are real effects. I mean, that's that's pretty uh, striking. Now, what about um, other uh, mood disorders like anxiety or, or or psychosis or bipolar? Are there any studies showing effect of food on those conditions? So there are observational studies on anxiety. Um, they're they're very all the effect that's similar to the depression, but just oh, far fewer of them. <laughs> um, I'm not aware of any randomized controlled trials of uh, food for anxiety. There's also really nothing for the other conditions, um, partly because it's it's it was hard to enroll major depression, which uh-huh. tends to be sort of a stable or a little bit older population. So if you're going to have people stick to a diet and stuff, it's going to be a little bit easier. Uh, very hard with chronic psychosis and things like that. What they have been trying to do or have try to do or run a few ketogenic diet studies like in psych hospitals um as far as i know those are still ongoing um there are small there are very small trials of things like gluten-free diets um and uh but really these are just pilots we're talking really a few patients um and there's some studies of ketogenic diets um and sometimes they've been extremely helpful but there's nothing big nothing big yeah i i i I'm sure you're familiar with Chris, Christopher Palmer's work, right? And yeah, so yeah. I, I think he's looked at ketogenic diets. Um, well, I don't know yeah, if he's Yeah, and he's getting some funding yeah. to try to run mm-hmm. some real studies, I believe. Um, but it's not, I don't know, it takes a long time. It takes um, a long time, yeah. And, and, it's, and it's, it's harder to get funding for food studies, right? You're not uh, getting the kind of funding you would get for a pharmaceutical. Right, yeah. It's a lot in the U.S., you know, the, the things that get funding are pharmaceuticals or devices. So there are lots of really interesting devices uh, that people are thinking about for major depression, like uh, the magnets and um, even light, like light, um, uh, laser light and LED light going through your eyes and your brain. Uh, yeah. And you're like, they literally put like a helmet on. <laughs> There's interesting studies, but of course people can make a lot of money with these devices, whereas they can't really make a lot of money if you just shop at the grocery store. Right. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about the effects of diets as whole diets, right? Mediterranean or ketogenic or low carb or whatever. But are there, you know, sometimes people are interested in specific components or ingredients. So omega-3 fatty acids or effects of dairy or fermented foods or specific micronutrients. Are there any good studies there that point to the effects of single dietary components? on mental health? So the study of nutritional research has been an abysmal failure, usually when they study uh, single components, especially on large populations. So 
for example, for a long time, they thought, oh, vitamin E might help with the dementia, for example. And they found that vitamin E actually probably just makes it worse if you do high dose vitamin E. Um, and you know, vitamin D for almost anything, except for if your vitamin D is low and your bones are cracking, um, you know, vitamin D in high doses generally hasn't helped any condition on its own. Um, however, that said, omega-3s are actually uh, a little separate from that. They ha- there have been studies, uh, the problem with omega-3s and things like probiotics is that it's not like Prozac, which is a fluoxetine, that every fluoxetine is the same. When you're talking about omega-3s and you're talking about uh, probiotics, most of the studies use slightly different formulations of things, so it's difficult to sort of compare them to each other. But for example, the ISNPR, which is the International Society of Nutritional Psychiatry Research, they came together and did a position paper on omega-3s and in there, which you can look up, and in that paper, they said, you know, they compared the studies of omega-3s with studies of um, Cymbalta, which is a major antidepressant, it's one of the relatively newer ones. Um, and they found that the effect of omega-3s on depression was similar to the effect of Cymbalta. So again, another um, with, you know, low risk of side effects, maybe a little bit uh, higher chances of bruising and bleeding and things like that. So um, it makes sense. You know, if you don't want to see a doctor and you're not suicidal and you don't need to see someone right away, if you want to add some more fish or maybe add some omega-3s to your diet, um, all of the studies just, um, to put this out there, all of the studies where it had an effect on mental health, and there's some for anxiety, like in medical students, et cetera, all of them were, um, so there's several omega-3s, ALA, and then that's uh, metabolized into EPA and DHA. Uh, EPA and DHA... Uh, are really only found in animal foods. However, you can make DHA from algae, for example, if you're a vegan. But um, all of the studies for uh, mental health and omega-3s, it's EPA has to be greater than the DHA. So a DHA-only supplement was not uh, sufficient to do anything for depression. It has to be EPA alone or EPA greater than DHA. So if you are buying an omega-3s thinking, I have a bit of anxiety, maybe this will help, just get your EPA greater than your DHA. Great. So I guess another form of evidence, and this gets back to one of the uh, the themes of ancestral health, is this idea of evolutionary mismatch, right? Right. That uh, the that our our bodies, our brains evolved under conditions that were very different than those in modern society, and and the diets were are, are quite different if you look at pre-industrial. Uh, hunter-gatherer populations or, or pre-agriculture populations, or even if you look at current existing uh, pastoralists or or uh, populations that have, have less exposure to a westernized diet, oh. have you looked at that sort of anthropological evidence on a population level, and does that provide any insights into uh, how diet can, can impact mental health uh, in those populations a- versus ours? That's a difficult question because, um, and I think we have more evidence historically. You know, there's evidence even back in Greek and Roman times, writings, people experiencing major depression. Um, They even used, there was like lithium um, springs that they would bring people with melancholy to. Yeah, there's a long history of if people are feeling down and out and they have the means, uh, they used to just ship them off to the seaside because they had better air, fish, you know, lots of minerals if you're bathing in the sea. Um, so, uh, and a populate, you know, it's difficult to assess the mental health of um, of different populations because the social con- uh, the social context and the anthropological context is just the hunter gatherer populations would be so different than ours that we can't even really use the same rating scales. So to my knowledge, that really hasn't been done. Um, certainly before processed foods existed, there was definitely there was definitely depression. There was definitely psychosis. Um, so it's not all related to that. And there's definitely, there are a lot of myths, for example, that in hunter-gatherer societies that people with psychosis are treated very well or considered, you know, like shamans, et cetera. But honestly, um, having talked to... Um, a professor over at Harvard who had spent a lot of time over in Africa, for example, and he said that a lot of times they were tied to a tree in the middle of the camp 
and people would throw food at them and not get near. I mean, they were not treated well. You know, it was, it's a fantasy mm-hmm. that psychosis is somehow just misunderstood as as a part of the human condition. It's 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 awful. Um, but how about de- how about depression and anxiety? Is can you say that the, that that was uh, a rarer in in those earlier populations, or or we don't know? That's a tough question too, because you'll see evidence that in depression and anxiety actually have actually been increasing in every generation. But again, it's it's difficult to really address that because how, were they even diagnosed? Were they ignored? I mean, yeah. I even have certain populations uh, come to me. You can't, you know, I might recommend in in the U.S., for example, if I have someone with like psychotic illness, um, there are many like family help groups, for example, for families of people with mental illness. And sometimes I've spoken to people from different cultures. They said, oh, no, we couldn't possibly go to a family help group because then people would know. You know it's, yeah. There's such a stigma, stigma. that uh, it's really difficult to uh, sort of compare apples versus apples. Um, there aren't apples and apples, it's apples and oranges. So I think all we can say that it's always existed, um, that uh, my theory, I think, is that uh, processed food um, and then also the sleep habits that we have now, our electronic, our lights too late, our um, all these kinds of things do add to the inflammatory burden. Because it's very clear, for example, that our populations now are very different with regards to cardiovascular risk and uh, obesity, of course. That's obvious. Yeah. I'm not sure that it's, you know, is, is rampant processed food making all of our mental health worse on a huge population level. I don't know. I guess I think about, and this is less data, this is more sort of anecdote or, or making hypothesis is sort of the nice way to, to describe it. But, you know, I, certainly I've had experiences in my life where I ate, uh, you know, a Snickers bar or something high in sugar, and a couple hours later, maybe I ate it at three o'clock, right? And then a couple hours later when I was driving home from work, I was in a really crappy mood from my sugar crash or, or whatever it was. And um, if we as a population just really ate better with less, you know, high sugar and high processed carbs so that you're not having like sugar oscillations uh, throughout your day. Um, and it's definitely so when your glucose level falls, um, that does lead to higher cortisol. Um, so there's definitely, again, a physiologic mechanism for that. So cortisol is a steroid and it can make you kind of cranky um, and maybe more aggressive. So would we not have so much road rage? If people aren't having like 3 p.m. Um, processed food snacks, or does it, or does that make you fat and happy? I don't, you know. Um, so uh, those are the kind of questions I sometimes think about, you know. Yeah, certainly, I I, I experience a much more even uh, energy level and mood uh, staying low carb or, or keto, or even doing intermittent fasting. There's less of that sh- sugar uh, down, yeah, up and down, yeah. So I so. I, that's it. This is kind of interesting, you know, the evidence from studies, uh, whether they be inter- interventional or not, are hard to tease out all the variables. And similarly, anthropologically, uh, cultural effects, dietary effects, that's hard to tease apart. But phys- physiology is something we can look at, right? That's that we right. can do it experimentally. So there's a couple of theories about why food, about how food interacts with mental health. Uh, you mentioned inflammation. Uh, there's talk about, um, I know that uh, Chris Palmer in his book, Brain Energy, thinks about mitochondrial dysfunction as maybe one of the drivers. You've mentioned um, brain chemicals like BDNF. Uh, there's the microbiome. Uh, there's hormones. Uh, there's a number of different ways to approach this physiologically. If you yeah. look at it fr- If you look at it physiologically, what to you is the most um, compelling argument that food affects our physiology in a way that can affect our mental health positively or negatively? Is it inflammation or is it something else? So I I would, and this can be variable depending on the condition, the person, um, but I would put sort of on a population level, my hat is on the inflammation side of things. And uh, inflammation is a horribly overused word, but also it, and it encompasses a lot. And so maybe it's unfair because obviously mitochondrial dysfunction is a very specific thing, whereas inflammation can mean issues with your microbiome, which also has, uh, it changes your hormones, um, 
And uh, they de there's definitely been studies, for example, people with acute bipolar uh, episodes in the hospital and they measure inflammatory cytokines, which are these little chemical yeah. message messengers in our body. They're huge, super high levels. In fact, similar to people who are in that medical ICU um, who are very sick, slightly different um, inflammatory cytokines, but there's definitely inflammation going on when people have bipolar disorder, uh, mania, for example, and they're in the hospital. Um, and there's also, you know, these bi-directional um, issues. If you have uh, depression, you're much more likely to have diabetes. And if you have diabetes, you're much more likely to have depression. Depression, it goes, or major depression, it goes both ways. So, and in fact, higher risk, in fact, most risk for mental illness, it kind of comes all together. Meaning that if you're higher risk for one mental illness, you're probably higher risk for several of them. Uh, it just kind of depends on your combination of genes and whatever's going on. But which one that you get is it more anxiety and depression? Do you happen to have a set of genes that makes you more vulnerable to schizophrenia, schizophrenia or bipolar, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so I I'm going to go with the inflammation as the main driver. However, there's some super interesting studies regarding mitochondria, and the ketogenic diet does help the mitochondria make um, uh, make power better. It, kind of, it can bypass some of the comp, uh, complexes that if your mitochondria aren't working very well, it can kind of jumpstart them. It can be sort of like better fuel in the brain for, um, and it's fairly specific to the brain, actually, because right, ketone right. bodies aren't going to be high anywhere else, right? Um, so so what, do you, what do you think of, of Chris Palmer's theory that mitochondrial dysfunction dysfunction really underlies a range of, of of mental disorders that it's it's common to them. Do you think he's oversimplifying it or do you think there's something to that theory? I guess I would weigh on the side of it's probably a bit of an oversimplification, but you know, I I don't know if I've ever met Chris Palmer, but I know yeah, I've talked to him many times and he's not um uh, he's generally a very careful clinician. Sometimes, sometimes when he talks on social media or whatever, it's sort of generalized. But that's how you have to talk on social media. So yeah. you can't do the specifics of the thing on Twitter, X or whatever it is. And um, and there are some interesting data points. For example, there was this. Uh, uh, he wasn't a psychiatrist. Uh, he was a neurologist. And he did some very interesting studies of uh, people who had just died who had schizophrenia, both on medicine and not on medicine. So it wasn't a medication effect. And um, he did very just... fine um, biopsies of the parts of the brain, you know, like the prefrontal cortex and stuff that has lots of deficits in schizophrenia, and was able to find in these cells um, uh, that these uh, cells had uh, problems with glycolysis, which is one of the major... Um, ways of creating energy in, in, in the brain and then or, or the whole body. Glycolysis runs everything, plants too. Anyway, so um, the uh, um, another interesting piece of evidence, for example, is if you add a phosphocreatine when you're starting an antidepressant, uh, there have been decent studies showing that uh, that makes the antidepressant work a lot faster. And now what does phosphocreatine do? It helps um, you recycle your en you, the energy batteries of the cell, not the batteries, but the, the actual molecules that, that, we, that are power in the cell, that like power things, is, they're called ATP. And phosphocreatine is one of the um, uh, precursors of ATP. So it helps you replete your ATP faster and faster. And so adding phosphocreatine to an antidepressant help the antidepressant work a lot faster. So that's evidence that it's a power problem in the brain, right? Are there are there natural dietary sources of phosphocreatine, or are you looking at this as purely as a supplement? This was a supplement study. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, creatine is found in skeletal muscle. So right. uh, we're talking- So that's another, that, so that, another- It might be one of the red meat advantages. That, again, I'm not suggesting a carnivore diet or anything like that. Um, would be better for depression or anything, but um, certainly no data about that. But um, that might be a reason why in those interventional whole diet studies that the ones without any red meat weren't as effective or didn't work. Great. So we've talked so far really about evidence and the the, the, the rationale for looking at food as a uh, a key effector of mood. But let's let's 
turn now to your own practice, right? You, you see patients. Um, how do you work this into your own practice? Do you, uh, do you look at food as an alternative to medication? Is that where you start? Do you look at combinations? How do you actually, in a practical sense, uh, employ diet in your own psychiatric practice? So first off, as a psychiatrist, I'm usually the fifth or sixth person who's seen the, the person. They've already gone to their primary care. They've gone to their uh, therapist. They've gone to a nurse practitioner. They've gone to another psychiatrist. And finally, they show up at my door. And so 99.5% of the patients I ever see are already on medications. So what uh, I primarily do is try to get a really detailed history. And part of that history, I ask about diet. And diet and food are, are really fun to talk about with people because it's a big part of people's lives. It can be a part, you know, if someone is chronically obese, they might just sort of hate food or they might really love it, but they've had, they, people can have really strained relationships with food. People have had histories of eating disorders, et cetera. And so getting that history and then what, what do you normally eat? And so then I might see if there's some vulnerabilities. For example, if someone's vegan, they're at higher risk of having low B12. Low B12 is associated with uh, depression. Um, they also might not get any, uh, they might only get the ALA omega-3s. And while we can break down ALA into uh, EPA and DHA, which are the two components that have been proven to be helpful for the brain, and in fact, the human brain, I think, has the highest concentrations of DHA of most mammals. Um, anyway, so... Uh, a vegan might be more vulnerable to have deficiencies in that or we're considering supplementation or could they maybe add some fish or some mussels or something like that, which are fortunately things like mussels are really good sources of zinc, B12, DHA, and EPA. And uh, mussels, uh, oysters, clams, all, the, all yeah. of those. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're actually really good sources. They don't, they don't have a face. The mussels mother doesn't miss it. Now a lot of vegans will eat them anyway, but it's just, uh -huh. again, if someone is sort of an ethical vegan, um, they might be open to adding the stuff or supplement, you know, um, and other people, they might have been told, oh, I need to avoid red meat altogether. You know, my dad died of a heart attack when he was 58 and my cardiologist told me to avoid red meat, but then they have low iron and they have um, maybe uh, low B12 can also be if you're avoiding a lot of meats. And so I might say, I'm also going to say, oh eat red meat for every meal. That's not what I would suggest. But I said, you know, it's probably not going to hurt your cardiovascular health to have a steak every couple weeks. Um, and that way, you know, you can get your iron up. You don't have to take a pill, that kind of thing. So once you, you can also talk, you're talking to an older person who has significant depression and they have dentures that don't fit very well. And so they're losing weight and they're not able to get all the nutrients they need. And a solution for that person might be, you know, this is, when you talk about ancestral health, this is not the, not the right direction, but more supplements and possibly even something like a nutrition shake or something like that that has I, vitamins in it, but that they can easily um, that they can easily eat. So it's really you really sort of dig down on what they're eating. Some people have absolutely zero interest in changing their diet. Um, it's just sort of like talking to somebody who's smoking and just, you know talking about, hey, have you ever thought about quitting smoking? And they're like, no, smoking's the only piece. So I have my entire day. I'm not going to quit. I could be dying and on my oxygen and I'm going to take my oxygen mask off and go to the door and, and smoke. I'm like, good. You fine. might not say good, but I, it's, you know, it's usually not worth sort of fighting with somebody like that. You should not smoke. Um, I, you have to meet people where they are. And so that's where food is really interesting because not a ton of people ask about what you eat all the time. A psychiatrist's job is to be really nosy. So it's, it doesn't sound really out of left field. I'm also, I'm not a registered dietitian. I went to medical school. We learn a lot about bi biochemistry. There's actually a lot of nutrition in biochemistry. So when they say, oh, doctors haven't had any nutrition, that's not really true. We haven't had nutritional classes like uh, RDs would have. Um, but so, but, so I'm not being like, oh, here is your 1200 calorie meal plan that you're going to be eating today. No. Um, I'm not qualified to do anything like that. But I can talk to somebody and say, well, you know, we're looking at what you ate in the last two days and I don't see any vegetables. Why is that? They're like, maybe they don't like vegetables. Okay, you know, maybe um, 
well, I've talked to people, they don't really know how to cook them. And they've tried them raw and they don't like them. And so we can talk about, oh, this is how you roast broccoli or steam broccoli. <laughs> you can even uh, uh, make very um, specific interventions just trying to mostly increase the variety of what people are eating. Um, maybe adding, maybe making changes. Say, I really like yogurt, white chocolate yogurt covered uh, pretzels. Um, and you're saying, well, you know, that's maybe not the healthiest choice. Do you like dark chocolate covered almonds? And that would have a bit of dark chocolate and then almonds, you know, nuts are actually a pretty decent source of a lot of vitamins and minerals. Um, can you go for more of a, I, I don't focus a ton on whole grains or grains, um, mostly because I think people eat plenty of grains. I, you know, I mean, grains are in they're, they're eating corn and their Doritos and they're, you know, so usually if you start steering people more towards Whole Foods, the the perimeter of the grocery store kind of thing, um, though, uh, personally, I think, uh, it, you know, if, if people don't have celiac or a wheat allergy, it's fine to, to eat gluten. It's not going to kill you. Um, what, do you just, what do you think of uh, David Perlmutter's, you know, grain brain theory? Do you think he there's something there or does he go too far? in demonizing grains i think he's one of the so i've never been a serious low carb that that's the cure for everything um because i i think you know if you're really talking about if you have a good metabolism um carbs are fine i think it's the processed carbs um that are the problem and i think it, partly because of the sugar aspects of them and then partly because of how they affect the microbiome in causing blooming of some of the bad guys and um, uh, other, you, you know, the microbiome mm -hmm. is like a jungle and you, you have good and bad guys in there and they need to be in a proper balance. And there's a lot of evidence that our modern diets keep them out of balance, which makes it an inflammatory state. And like, for example, you can take the microbiome from a depressed human and uh, give it to a rat, uh, not... The, the rats are raised with uh, germ-free, basically, and you can make the rat depressed. So um, I, they didn't give the rat like a, a questionnaire, but <laughs> they have some <laughs> ways to on their behaviors. There's, there's some tests, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there's that you're basically we're taking an inflammatory microbiome and depositing it in something else and making them depressed. So... Um, I forget what the original question was, but. Well, it, com coming back to this, your own practice, it's just great. You you take people where they are, right? Yeah, as they yeah. As they come to you. And uh, if they're more open to dietary changes or less, you're able to work with that. That's fantastic. Can you and tell if us. Really, if they really want a very serious, no, I want the full diet. I want the full nutritional deal. Yeah. I can recommend some nutritionists who um, hmm. will work with you know, what they want, like if they want it to be low carb or if they want it to be keto or if they want paleo or whatever it is, um, um, you just have to kind of know some nutritionists to refer to. So c can you just tell us a few success stories you've had where an intervention, whether it be a change in diet or a supplement, you, you saw a significant improvement in, in uh, depression or anxiety or psychosis? Uh, so I had a, uh, a case now, this was printed in the New England Journal of Medicine, so I'm not giving away any <laughs> information that's not already out there. And she was known to have celiac disease and also a psychosis. And when she was positive for wheat eating, she was more psychotic. And when she um, was not eating any wheat, she was actually okay for a long time. Um, and so that was very interesting. Again, it was such an interesting case that it made the New England Journal of Medicine um, but I've had other people that it's pretty clear, uh, it, one with bipolar disorder, they're probably celiac because it runs in the family, um, but discovered er very early on that eating, not eating wheat really kept their mood quite stable. So it was not, in order to be tested for celiac, other than testing the genes, you have to be eating gluten. Um, because they do like biopsies of the colon and they can also test for anti-gluten antibodies. And this person was not willing to go back on gluten because they didn't want to become psychotic again, um, which I think is very reasonable. 
So we're pres- presuming that person is celiac, and they do quite well. Um, on, uh, I've not seen wheat avoidance necessarily help with mental health if the person wasn't celiac. So in celiac, you have an autoimmune reaction to wheat, so an inflammatory reaction to wheat, right? Um, and that can definitely cause all sorts of delusions, psychosis, et cetera. Um, so far as other interventions, certainly improved matters with certain B vitamins, um, with uh, definitely with iron, because low iron is very common, I think, in women, even in the US. So uh, like women 12 to 30, I think, like one in four are iron deficient at any given time. It's super common. So what what um, improvements did you see with the B vitamin or iron supplementation? So B vitamin, if your B12 is low, can directly improve. Uh, your nerves need B12 to be powered. Um, and so what I'll see is someone with a really dragging low energy depression can uh, pretty quickly become very improved on it. They could just think better and think clearer and all, they're not dragging and they have more energy. Iron tends to present sometimes it's cognitive dulling because again without iron you can't really power bring oxygen well to your brain um uh, but they tend to have more anxiety because when you have low iron too if you're walking up the stairs your heart will start to race and it's not just because you're out of shape um and they tend to also have you'll you'll feel like you're running out of oxygen so they'll have you have to breathe heavier and and get out of out of breath more quickly and so that that feeling is not pleasant and it feels like anxiety and so you will start to have um anxiety just even thinking about that so and you also need iron actually for your neurotransmitters to work well as well and for anti- antidepressant medicine to work you need iron and zinc and b12 for all these things to work so all of a sudden you'll find people are having side effects to their meds for the first time if they, if they start yeah. uh a folate or or whatever it is there are some very interesting studies now this is it's by the group, uh, it's now called Hardy Vitamins in um, in uh, uh, Canada. And they are, I like that vitamin because most, a lot of uh, supplement studies are not done very well. Um, but Hardy, they actually, they send out their meds, um, uh, this, this type of vitamins called... Um, uh, dietary essential nutrients, I think, is what their high-powered vitamins are. And there's certain families and um, other people. There's there's running trying to run a study in Maine, actually using daily essential nutrients is what it is um, for bipolar. And um, there's some very interesting data on that. There's a a book called The Better Brain by Julia Rutledge. That's very interesting. It's more about. It's not really about dietary intervention. It's about this these supplements and vitamins. Um, and they've had a, good luck with ADHD and um, bipolar disorder. I, I think it's been less focused on depression for whatever reason. Um, I think original the family that originally started using these vitamins, they used it in their own family, and that's why they decided and it helped. They had a strong uh, history of uh, bipolar. And schizophrenia in that that family, and they found that it helped. Um, Have you found that um, removing uh, simple sugars or processed carbs or going full on ketogenic has in any of your patients have you have you seen those benefits? I know I the reports I've read in in the, uh, Chris Palmer's book seem to show that, but have you had any experience using ketogenic or you know uh, low low carb? to help uh, mood? I've seen, in one case, bipolar go away with ketogenic diet. Um, I've seen, oh, most of the people, I have to say, most of the people who come to me who with dietary control things already discovered that the diet really fixes them and they want a psychiatrist who is understanding of that is not going to be like, oh, that's ridiculous. Um, so I, there are several cases of that. I know people online who had depression and anxiety from childhood, who the minute they went on a ketogenic diet, all of a sudden it fell away and they were almost a completely different person. So uh, this is all anecdotal evidence. Right. Um, a lot of people just really aren't interested in trying a ketogenic diet, you know, in my, sort of the general population. And I'm not going to hammer on somebody, no, you have to try, you know, because there are some people where it didn't affect them at all. And 
certainly a lot of people when they f- go on ketogenic diets, I know when I've been strict ketogenic, and it's not just the first two weeks, but I, it really affects my sleep in a very negative way. So yeah. um, I, I do much better on sort of more of a, it's not exactly low carb, but it's what, uh, oh, the four hour body guy. Um, Tim Ferriss. Slow, slow carb. Slow, I'm sorry. Slow carb. Yes. Yeah. Tim, so Tim that's Ferriss. where I kind of live. Um, yeah. You know, but. Um, so blood sugar control really is. Yeah, and, and there's yeah. certainly some cases, this has happened multiple times where I've had people wake up like at midnight with anxiety, palpitations, and nightmares. And I said, okay, well, what are you eating right before bed? And it tended to be they were eating, you know, Doritos or um, even something like a low fat potato chip or something like that right before bed. And we said, well, why don't we just try it? Because maybe, so they're eating a lot of carbs, a lot of quick digested carbs right before bed. And then, you know, 90 minutes later, they get a compensatory bit of a sugar crash. I'm not talking about a diabetic or anything like that. This can happen normally because if you eat high processed carbs and you get a b- big bolus all at once, you respond, your pancreas says, oh, got to get to work. And it sends out a lot of insulin and that make, that gives you with a big change in your blood sugar level. They've actually found, they did uh, comparative studies of like prisoners versus uh, violent prisoners versus the general population and violent prisoners interestingly had in general a higher their uh oral glucose tolerance tests were way more Mm. um you know like this than this now mine um personally my uh i can't tolerate high levels of sugar this is probably why i was interested in the paleo diet and this stuff in general even from the age of 18 like i I couldn't drink a glass of orange juice because i'd practically you'd have to pull me off the floor 90 minutes later Um, so i've always had to restrict my sugars from the time i was a teenager um and i never had diabetes or anything like that but uh so maybe i'm a violent criminal i don't know anyway (laughs) it's not always associated with violence and being aggressive and being in jail but i just thought it was an interesting finding and um I've had people where if they change that nighttime sugar bolus or carb bolus to let's all, you know, we do you like uh, protein shakes or uh, maybe an apple and a string cheese instead? Something that's more, uh, more fiber, more uh, protein, more a little, maybe a little more fat to smooth yeah. out that thing. Like ice cream will give you a totally different sugar profile than sorbet, for example. Right. Um, so, uh, and all of a sudden, they're not waking up in the middle of the night with their panic attacks. So uh, you can definitely, by smoothing out that blood sugar response and giving more uh, whole foods in general. And I, I'm not necessarily talking about paleo in this case, because we're also talking about legumes and whole grains and things like that. that are a little bit more like the slow carbs um, that people tend, as you said, have a smoother mood throughout the day. And I think a lot of people have had that experience. So I don't think it's kind of like, you know, Nobody will argue with the fact that your mood state and your emotional state doesn't affect your physical state because everybody's had a tension headache. Everybody's had their, you know, in that nervous situation, the rumbling stomach. So everyone gets that it can go that way. Um, so to, that it's the opposite to your physical state um, can also affect your mental state. People understand that too. When you're under a lot of pain from a broken leg or whatever it is, you're, you're generally grumpier and, um, uh, maybe not particularly happy. So um, I think the biggest thing when the nutritional psychiatry began was there was this idea, particularly after all of those failed single nutrient studies that I mentioned, that food didn't have anything to do with mood. I think that was a prevalent idea. And it's a ridiculous thing to say. A cardiologist would never say that, that food has nothing to do with your heart conditions. A diet, you know, An endocrinologist who treats diabetes would never say that food has nothing to do with their diabetes. Um, uh, so in some cases, it's maybe a virus killed your pancreas, you know, caused an autoimmune reaction that killed your islet cells, and that gave you d- type one diabetes. But um, you know, it's that's what nutritional psychiatry is about. Is it? Yes, what you you are, what you eat. You know. Yeah, and I, and I think you and you've mentioned this in some of your talks that that twenty years ago, <laughs> this was denied. Right, the standard position was food had nothing to do with psychiatric conditions. But I, I think you also mentioned that there was a an article, a editorial or an article in Lancet that finally acknowledged that diet can impact psychology. So do you think that the profession is coming around 
uh, not, not just informally, but to formally acknowledge this connection between uh, food and, and mental health. I, th- I mean, I think so. And I have to say, it's been a while because COVID kind of stopped my kind of turning in things to go to, um, and other personal things happen. So I've not been doing too many talks recently. But every time we went to the APA, Drew Ramsey is a nutritional psychiatrist. He's a great Instagram and several books. Um, he and I used to present at the American Psychiatric Association. We probably did it six times. Um Every time we had huge rooms and it was overflow. People were dying to learn about this stuff and how to be helpful. Um, I think people are afraid that they're overstepping what they know. I mean, I've made it an effort to learn a lot about supplements and different kinds and that kind of stuff. But you, again, you don't have to be a registered dietitian to say, oh, maybe add some more fish to your diet or maybe add some, you know, or and also to be able to recognize some of the symptoms of a B12 deficiency or an iron deficiency so that you don't miss it because it's really ridiculous to give someone Prozac if they don't have any iron you know if you haven't even asked about it yeah so how does this work somebody comes to you they're on medication yeah, they might totally, want yeah. they might they might want to get off or reduce their meds because there's side effects uh food can certainly help there do you have any experience where dietary interventions have helped patients reduce or come off of their psychiatric meds? And also, how do you handle this kind of from a risk and liability standpoint? Because that's a, that can be a little bit touchy. What is your approach to helping people reduce or come off their meds? So yeah, if people get exercise and diet in shape and lose, especially if they lose weight and things, people are often able to come off if they're on sort of a minor antidepressant for um, just... A situational depression, a lot of people get put on an antidepressant by their primary care doctor, and it's been several years, and they're not really sure they need it. We talk about, okay, well, that stressor that was causing this problem, it's not there anymore. Do you want to try to taper off your med carefully? you got to do it slowly. And in the meantime, we can try all these other things that are known to be helpful. And sure, you can be very successful. I mean, someone is, um, with the exception of one celiac case, For the most part, if people are on mood stabilizers or if they've had suicide attempts or if you've had repeated episodes of depression, if you've had two prior episodes, you're about 90% likely to have a third. doesn't mean that you necessarily need to be medicated um, the entire time, but you just have to be more careful. Um, And there's certain situations in people, and we do a lot of training in this about suicide risk factors. So... um, you just want to be very available. So if something goes south, they can call you and you can adjust very quickly. That's kind of how that works. Have um, you had successes though with people reducing or totally yeah, stopping? Yeah, I mean, all the time, sure. If, um, especially with like depression or anxiety, you have other, and it's usually not just diet alone. It's usually not so clean. So it's hard for me to just sort, of, sort out a, it's usually they're adding diet. They're taking better care of themselves in general. So they're sleeping better. They drop out alcohol. Um, that could be huge, you, tremendous. You, um, yeah, you, you mentioned exercise. Um, yeah, and so adding more activity um, or ac- different activity because maybe the activity they were doing before was uh, causing them injuries all the time or they were overworking, causing more stress. Uh, so, yeah, I've also had people, this is more controversial and, again, more people come to me after fixing their problem than before, but... Um, a diet, any kind of dietary change can cause an eating disorder. So it can make you obsessed with diet and losing weight and counting all your calories can kind of make people really obsessed with food. But yeah. I've had other people who, if they switched from counting calories or whatever it was to just, okay, well, I'm just not going to eat processed foods for the most part, except every once in a while I'll have cake at my birthday or whatever it is. They think much less about food because they don't have, they can just go out and like, okay, I'm just not going to eat that. And all of a sudden, they're, they go from obsessing about food all the time to not obsessing about food, really from sometimes from an eating disorder situation to a not eating disorder situation. And in general, eating disorders, they would advise you not to restrict the diets of people with eating disorders. Um, these are people that sort of already figured that out and it's working for them. So it's not really risky on my part to continue that. Um, people with, the, with eating disorders, it's complicated because it can go... Different people seem to work work very well either with certain restrictions or just eating the same thing every day so they're no longer losing weight, but they don't have to think about it all the time. Again, not 
not the best way maybe to live an entire life, but it's better than being in the hospital all the time. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So once if people are able to take on new diets or even just change from oh my breakfast was just a Cadbury cream egg or nothing again nothing against the occasional Cadbury cream egg, but um, you change that to um, or they weren't eating breakfast at all and they were. Um, then starving at 10 a.m. So they just grab whatever candy that is out at the office or whatever it is. And you say, okay, well, what can you do for a quick breakfast? And so these little things can make an adjustment and can make a big difference over time. And yes, I have had success. I I have not been running a study on my patients, you know, so I, I don't think there are few cases where you could say, oh, we just changed this again before dinner snack. And that really fixed a lot of things that I talked about with the uh, waking up with nightmares and anxiety. Um, and it doesn't work for everybody who wakes up at midnight with nightmares for anxiety. It's not all explained by what they're eating before bed. But um, so there are some few very clean uh, sort of case studies like that. But most people, their improvement is multifactorial. Um, sure. Not, but also the psychotherapy side of things. So how are your relations? I mean, I talk, I talk about all those things too. So <laughs> um, these, th- these things uh, work together, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So um, maybe to kind of, uh, pull this all together. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing these days in terms of writing? Are you is your blog uh, active? Um, are you planning any presentations or any research? Or is your focus mainly on your practice? What, what what's going on um, with your your work and your plans? With the pandemic and changing everything to online, I was having less fun with teaching, so I resigned my um, Harvard position. 2021. Um, and also, this is actually the pandemic too, because it was just an interest of mine. I'd always been in the 90s and read all those virus hunter things and was always just interested in... Um, I had a great aunt die in uh, the flu pandemic in 1919. Um, and another, actually my, another great uncle ended up getting the um, encephalitis um, and was institutionalized after the flu, the, the fatigue encephalitis, I think might be sort of like the long COVID of the 1919 flu. Anyway, sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was really more interested in that um, for about two years. And then as it has happened sometimes in my lifetime, I sort of stopped writing altogether for a little while. And there are multiple reasons for that. Um, so what I've done recently, I've done a couple podcasts recently, um, this is probably the third one I've done um, in the past year. And I've been invited for a couple, these are more academic presentations. So residency programs want to learn a little more about evolutionary psychiatry or nutritional psychiatry. I haven't put in any, you know, you have to apply to present at a um, convention or, or whatever it is. And I haven't done that recently. I, th- I think I certainly would be interested in um the next ISNPR, which I have to see where it is. The, the last one, I believe, there was one in Australia and one in Istanbul or something more recently. And I, I have gone to the one in London and the one when it was in Washington, D.C. or Atlanta. I know it was Washington, D.C., I think. Um, and uh, if they come closer than Australia next time, I think I'll go. Um, well, I know Mike, your talk your talks at uh, AHS were, were very well uh, appreciated and... Uh, once we start that up again, um, that might be another venue, right? Yeah. Because that's, that's an interesting kind of mixed audience of professionals, academics, and lay people too. I re- I've always really enjoyed AHS. And I, of course, I see a ton of friends there. So yeah, I'd always be welcome. I would yeah. I'd be, always be honored to to okay. um, to present there on different stuff. I have faded back a little bit for various reasons, partly Partly was the pandemic to sort of put a kibosh on everything for several years, but then also my kids are kind of teens. And so um, weirdly, you kind of need to be around more in the afternoon. And so <laughs> they don't have driver's license yet. So I've got to be, you know, we're driving them around everywhere. So it's just been, I've just been a little bit more homebound recently and not traveling nearly as much. Um, but yeah, it wouldn't be nice to get back in the swing of things. Um, yeah. I think my most recent... My most recent presentation was at a, it was in LA. It was an ancestral event. Um, it was 2020 or 2021, but I don't, I haven't done a presentation since then. 
So it was on, sure. it was actually interesting. It was on um, how infectious disease uh, and the history of epidemics affected mental health. Hmm. Um, again, and it was more that my focus for a few years with the pandemic. So for a few years. Yeah. Great. Well, I, uh, you, one thing we'll do is in our, in our show notes, if you have any links to, to some of the studies you mentioned that you think would be interesting to viewers, we can put those on. Um, it, it's always good to have that sort of, um, because I know you've okay. really de- you've really delved into the studies, um, yeah, and and I think that's that's pretty interesting. Um, well, thank you so much, Emily Deans, for the conversation today. I've enjoyed it, learned a lot, and I think this is going to be of uh, interest to this uh, audience uh, because we're always looking at how we can be inspired by evolutionary health, by the idea of mismatch, and and what it is we can do to be inspired by ideas of how our how our early human ancestors evolved uh, not Did, just have, for our fi- yeah have, not just for, I have hundreds physical- of articles Mo- a lot of them are with food and mood but many of them are about um, genes some of them are about you know exercise some of them are about a lot of them are about light management and sleep management so all of those are up at psychology today and you just google evolutionary psychiatry psychology today and they're all there um, yeah, yeah. We'll cer- we'll certainly put your your uh, your blog uh, up uh, for the readers too. Yeah, yeah. And thanks for having me on. I could obviously talk yep. about this stuff for hours, <laughs> so I really appreciate it. All right. Well, it's been fun. Thanks again. Um, enjoyed it. And uh, again, Dr. Emily Deans, uh, ch- check out her blog on uh, on, on evolutionary psych- psychiatry. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Ancestral Health Today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion on how evolutionary insights can inform modern health practices. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast to catch future episodes.